I said last class, this lecture is normally what I, you know, the, the last two years when I taught this course previously, this, this lecture here is what I would actually put at the end of the, the semester, right? Because this is like, this is the advanced and the advanced part of the name of the course. Uh, but I think it's so important and it, uh, it's going to uh, be again, permeate through all the topics we talk about throughout the, the semester. And as you guys are seeing in the, in the first, first project, you have to you know, understand how code, code, code generation and query compilation works. Um, that I, I wanted to, to push it up as the third lecture. And also when I go look on YouTube and I see like what lectures people watch, everyone watches the first one, and the second one has half as many watchers, and the third one has half as many watchers. Then after that, like everybody drops off. So <laughs> I feel like I'm doing the world a service by putting this important topic as the third lecture, because then at least some people will actually see it, right? More than, more so than it would than it would if it was at the end of the semester. So all right. So today's topic, we're going to talk about query compilation and code generation. Um, so I'm going to start off with the background and talk about why you. Uh, what, what's the motivation for this? Why we actually want to do code generation? Why do we spend the time of doing you know, a lot of work to make actually you know, something you can implement in a database system? Um, and then there's basically two methods to do this. So we're going to first start off talking about the first one called translation or source-to-source source, source source compilation. And then we're going to talk about the technique that was in the hyper paper that you guys read doing just-in-time compilation with the LLVM. Uh, and the spoiler of the lecture is that it is my opinion that this, this second approach is, is the better way to go. Uh, and most systems that actually do query compilation are doing the second approach. And then I'll finish off talking about talk, uh, what are some other real-world systems beyond just at, us at CMU or Hyper in, in Munich uh, that are doing uh, code generation query compilation. Okay? So, We've already said at the beginning of the semester that we were going to make our, you know, we, we were going to get rid of the disk and we we're going to go to an in-memory database system architecture. And that's going to give us a huge speed up. But now if we want to go even faster, right, if we want to put everything in memory, what's next? What can we do to actually speed up our system and make it more efficient? Um, and there's this great comment, side comment from uh, a paper from the Hexon guys a few years ago when they were talking about how, what they were going to do to build up, to, to speed up their database engine. So Hackathon is, is a system that, or, or database engine we're going to cover throughout the semester. The background was, it's a, it was a sorry, it's an in-memory database engine that Microsoft developed uh, in recent years to speed up the performance of the regular SQL Server engine. So uh, the, the SQL Server is, was, was 25 years old, and at the time they started the Hackathon project, and so they got some really awesome database people, Mike Zwilling, uh, one of the original guys who helped port Sybase to Windows NT. And actually, he was the guy that helped build the Shore system you read about last class at, uh, in, in the University of Wisconsin. And Paul Larson, another famous database researcher. And they basically said, let's design a new engine to make SQL Server be relevant for the next 25 years. Right? And so if you start looking about what can you do to speed up your database system, if everything's already in memory, what do you do next? And so they came with this, came up this, this back of the envelope calculation that, that I really like, where they basically said, well, if you want your database system to go 10x faster, then you need to execute 90% fewer instructions. But then if you want your database system to go 100x faster, you gotta cut out 99% of the instructions. So the, the first one, that's, that's doable, right? It's not easy, but that's, that's possible. But slicing out 99% of the instructions, that's, that's pretty challenging. That's pretty hard, right? And so that's sort of what the, 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 the motivation for what we're going to talk about today is, is how can we get closer to this number here, right? right? There's no magic flag in GCC, like we can set O100, that's going to make all these instructions go away, right? We're going to have to be, uh, do careful engineering and reevaluate how we design our, our database system. So another thing to also say that in, in this class, for this lecture, we'll mostly talk about instructions, but another useful metric that we're going to care about throughout the semester as well is also instructions per cycle, right? So you want to reduce the number of instructions, but also within a, a single cycle on your CPU, you want to execute as many things as possible. And that essentially means trying to, to minimize the number of cache misses. And this is also very related to, the, to, to the, what the hyper guys are doing as well. So, the, 
only really option we have to, to achieve this goal of cutting down on the number of instructions in, in our data system is through code specialization. And so the idea of code specialization is that instead of having this general purpose database system that knows how to operate any or execute any possible query that, could, that, that you throw at it, the idea is that we're going to generate code that is specific to doing one particular task in, in our system. And that's essentially going to mean being just executing a single query, right? And then, so what's going to happen is there's going to be all this extra stuff we'd have to do if we were, if we were doing interpretation, meaning like as we execute a query, we have to look at the, the you know, what, what's in the where clause, um, and then for every single tuple, figure out what the type is, uh, whether it's a null or not. There's all of these extra stuff you have to do uh, when, you're, when you don't know what the data could be when you're trying to execute a query on it. And with code specialization, we can just basically bake into some, some machine code or executable code exactly everything we know about the data and exactly everything we know about the query. And we don't need to have any giant switch clauses that says, if it's an int, do this. If it's a float, do that. Right? We know everything a priori. And so the, the reason why this is now sort of uh, in vogue um, and why a lot of existing systems don't actually do this kind of stuff is that what's going to end up being happen is the way that is the, the, the way to write your, your database engine, the source code itself, the, the, the way to write it that's most easily understandable by us humans actually often turns out to be the worst way to, to, to write it for your CPU. So this is why most systems don't start off doing code specializations, right? Most systems do the interpreted engine, right? Which is what we had originally in Peloton. Right? And because that's easy for, for humans to understand and engineer. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples uh, uh, during this lecture. And the, the example database I'm going to use for all of these examples is this really simple one here that comes from the hyperpaper. Right? It's a, a three table database, A, B, and C. A and B have uh, integer primary keys and a value. And then C has foreign key references to both uh, A and B. So the first thing we need to talk about is how to actually want to process a query, right? So the standard way that everyone does this, and in the introduction class, this is the way we, we teach it, is, is through the tuple at a time query processing model. Sometimes called the iterator model or the, the volcano model. Volcano was an influential system from the late 1980s. They did a, from the Gertz Graphy guy, uh, and he's done a, a ton of different stuff in this area. And one of the things Volcano proposed was this this tuple at a time uh, uh, query processing model. Now, it's not to say that, that things that people weren't processing queries in this way before this, but he sort of laid out how to do this. And there's some extra stuff that they add in the volcano on how to do this in parallel. But for that, we can ignore for now. So the, the, the tuple at a time operator model, query processing model, is basically where you traverse the query plan tree and you call next on your child operator to go pull up data from, from, the, from the guy below you. All right, so here we have a really simple SQL, SQL statement, select star from A, or select uh, ID from A, B from val, doing a simple uh, inner join on A and B, and then doing a filter on B dot val. Right, so this is the, this is the, 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 the query plan that, that the data system would generate. Right, You have this, the access method scans on A, then you do the filter on B, then the join, and then the uh, projection. So with the two-point time operator model, uh, what happens is you start at the root at the uh, projection, and then this guy would iterate over uh, the, all the tuples that its child operator would produce. And so it calls next on this, says, give me the next tuple you have. The join says, I don't have anything, so I'll call next to my children. And then this guy uh, then does the actual the scan on the table and then produces the tuples. All right, so you're sort of starting from the top, going down, and, and, and pulling data up. The other alternative is the operator at a time model. I think the hyper paper refers this to as the materialization uh, model. And basically what happens here is that rather, rather than starting at the top and going down, you start at the bottom. Each operator executes on, on its data and generates its complete output, right? So for A, if I had to scan all the tuples, all, my, my output is all the tuples in A. And then you push them up into the operator above you, right? Same thing for B pushes up in here, do the filter, and then it goes up to the join, right? 
So the advantage of this is that you don't keep calling next as you go down, right? It's just sort of execute all at once, and then you, you shove it up, and you never go back to it and ask for, for more. Um, this is actually a, a good way to do this for an in-memory database if you're doing uh, OLTP workloads. This is actually what we implemented, uh, what I helped implement in HDR and MultiB. Right. Uh, MoDB actually implements this as well, which I, I disagree with because they're doing OLAP queries, um, and they've done they try to work around it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but the advantage of this is that essentially you don't have to call next and you don't have to sort of do all these function uh, pointer lookups, right? Because now we said we're in memory database now. So function, uh, function pointers are our are, are, are enemy when you try to reduce, reduce them, right? Because it, it's additional branches and additional lookups. Whereas the operator time model, we don't have any of that. We just run it once, spits up an output, and we keep going. The, the best way I think of both worlds is the vector at a time model. Um, and this was proposed by the, the VectorWise guys, which is a system we'll talk about um, later in, in the class. Uh, but they're, so they're going to be like the total at a time model where they're starting at the top going down. But instead of every single time you call next, you get one tuple, you get a vector of tuples. And instead you get a batch, a batch of tuples. Right? Um, and this has the advantage of you reduce the number of function calls as you would in the operator time. But you don't need to materialize the, the you know entire table to show it up to the next guy, right? All right. So again, we'll see this when we talk about hy the hyper way, uh, way of doing compilation. They're going to try to do uh, tuple at a time, but they want to push things up like the operator model rather than making all these function calls and, and going down. And this is how they're going to get better cache locality and reduce the number of instructions they have to execute. All right. So now let's look at a more complicated example here. And again, this is also from the hyper paper. So we're gonna do a three-way join between A, B, and C. Uh, so we're gonna do an inner join on A and B, and then, sorry, A and C, and then we'll have a nested query in our from clause where we do, do an aggregation on B. So the, we'll cover this later when we talk about query optimization and rewriting. Essentially, with the way you would execute this query is the optimizer can rewrite the, the inner nested query into a join operator. <clears throat> Uh, that's the most common way and usually the best way. The alternative is actually execute this once, put into a temp table, and then do a join into it. But we don't, for this query, we don't have to do that. And so if we're taking the tuple at a time approach, uh, the pseudocode would sort of look, look something like this. Now, I always tell my students whenever, time, whenever they give a talk, either in a class or at a, at a conference, right, or, or you know, at, at, at a group meeting, never show code because everyone's eyes glaze over because they're trying to read it instead of listening to you. Uh, and I'm going to violate that here. You kind of have to, right? If you're going to talk about code compilation or code generation and query compilation, you kind of have to show code. So just, just bear with me here, okay? So if we're doing the tuple, tuple at a time approach, the volcano model, we would start at the root uh, uh, where we have this join, and then we're going to have a for loop where we're going to iterate over all of the children, all the tuples generated by our child on the left. So at the beginning, we call uh, left.next. And that goes down here, and, it's, and so you're trying to get the next tuple that it has. But at this point, we don't have any tuples, so it's going to look at its child and call next on that. Goes down here, go grabs the single tuple, and then and then pushes this back up, right, or pulls it up. So the this approach is fine if you're a disk-based data system, because again, we don't care about function pointers. But now, if we're in memory, all of these next calls, all of these branches, this this is problematic, right? This is slow. Because right, we're executing additional instructions to you know, check things as, as we go along. Right? So this is, this is one big thing we, we can use or of try to avoid to reduce the number of instructions we, we're executing to speed up our query. The other thing I want to point out now, too, is while we're executing this query, right, we have all of these predicates where, where we have to evaluate for every single tuple that we, we look at. You know, to decide whether it, it matches or satisfies the predicate, and then we want to, you know, uh, move it up into the, into the tree. So let's start with, let's use just this, this one as an example here, right, inside of our nested query. b.val equals uh, question mark, which means it's an input variable. This is something that the client will provide you at runtime. Like, this is a prepared <coughs> thing. Right, so input variable plus one. So the way a data system is going to represent uh, a where clause predicate like this is through an expression tree. Right? And basically, the expression tree is just, just picking apart the different, different operat operators you have in your, in your expression and uh, filling out a tree like this. Right? So 
if I want to evaluate for a single tuple, whether b dot val, the value of the, the value of the val attribute for that tuple, equals my input parameter plus one, I have to traverse this tree and evaluate evaluate it and see whether it evaluates to true. And if so, then I know it's, it should be included in my output. So the way you would traverse this, you would start off with the, uh, the equal sign here, right? And you would go down to, your, to, to this side, and you would have a, a, an operator expression that says, give me the value of the dot val attribute for this tuple. So what happens is it, when you execute and process the tree, when you walk through it, you're also providing some execution context with information about the tuple that you're operating on and some other things that are going on for your transaction or your query, query while it's running. So in this case here, we would maintain in our execution top context a, a pointer to the tuple that we're currently processing. So in order to get the, the, the dot val or the val uh, attribute, I'd have to also look up in the schema for this for this tuple and say, well, what at what offset is the is the val attribute? <coughs> right? So in this case here, I have uh, two 32 bit integers, so I'd have to do some arithmetic to know that I need to jump to uh, 32 bits over to find the starting point of the val attribute. And once I have that, then I know that the value will be 1,000, because that's what's in this tuple here. Then I go back up the tree, come down here to this addition operator, same thing. Now I go down to my left side, and I want to evaluate this parameter. So in this case here, <coughs> I've also provided the input parameters that the client specified when they invoked this query. right? So in this case here, 999 would be substituted for the question mark here. Um, so again, same thing. I know how to jump to the offset in my input query parameter array. I get back 999, go back to the other side, now I get a constant. This one's pretty easy, right? It's just baked into one, right? So now that I have all the values for my, uh, my children for the addition expression, I can then move them up, get 1,000, go up to the equal sign, and then evaluate, see whether 1,000 equals 1,000, and which is true. And at this point, I know I, this, this tuple has satisfied this predicate, and therefore, it should be emitted in the output. This sounds like a lot of work, right? And so now if you have a billion tuples, right, in your table B, you're scanning through one billion times and, and traversing this tree, making these function call uh, lookups, looking up things in memory up in there, just to evaluate whether 1,000 equals 999 plus 1. All right? So this is, this is really expensive. There's a bunch of other stuff that's going on that I'm not even showing here that you have to do as well. So I have to check to see whether these the, 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 the tuple parameter is null, right? Because null can't equal to anything. So I have to check to, you know, whether, uh, we'll talk about how to implement nulls later on, but it could be a separate uh, bitmap that I have to check, or I could check a specific value in my range of, of integers that would tell me whether it's null or not, or I have to check a little flag in front of it. So there's a bunch of extra stuff I have to do at every step of the way to check whether something's null or not. And that becomes get expensive. So all of this is we'd have to we'd have to do in a in a sort of general purpose interpreted engine because I can take now any predicate and, and generate a tree like this, and I the system is going to know how to traverse it and, and compute the answer that you want. But this, again, this is all really really expensive to do when your database fits entirely in memory. So the way to solve this is through code specialization. And the idea is that anytime we have a CPU intensive task that we need to execute repeatedly inside of our database system, um, and when it's something that we're going to keep doing over and over again just with different input values, like in that case here, like I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm traversing that expression tree uh, just with different input values every, every time I run, uh, for, you know, for different, different function pointers to different tuples. Um, anytime I have something like that, then I want to be able to try to compile it down into native executable code and invoke that instead of the slower, you know, general purpose version of it. Right, so that's the, that's the main idea what we're trying to achieve with, with query compilation code and code specialization. So a bunch of different things that we can do in addition to the operator execution and the predicate evaluation, which I just showed in previously. We can also use this for our access methods, right, as we actually scan the tables uh, say we're doing a scan and we just want one column, uh, we can bake into our, our specialized code to know how to jump to the right offset for, for your row to find the, find the value that, that you want. We won't talk about this so much in this class, but you also can compile down store procedures. Um, so say instead of having PLPG SQL that you want to interpret 
every single time you evoke a transaction, you could just compile that store procedure into machine code and just execute that directly. And that's going to be way, way faster. I know Oracle does this. Um, we're working on adding this and uh, in our own system and SQL Server can do this. Right, PLVG SQL is actually really slow to execute because it basically takes everything that's in there and converts it to a select statement. Right, so say you have A equals A plus one, right? It converts that to a select A plus one, right? So that, that, that's gonna be really slow. Um, and then the last one here, logging and recovery. Uh, as far as I know, this is not something anybody has done yet. This is something we're interested in exploring here at CMU once we fit, fix our regular Red Hat logging stuff. Uh, but the idea here is like, again, think of something that would be repetitive you're doing over and over again. Parsing log records to figure out when, you know, upon recovery, what change you need to install into the database. That's something we think we could, we could co-specialize as well and speed things up. So the benefits of doing this, I, I, sorry, yes. Is there too much work or because recovery is going to run only during the, while the database is starting, is starting up, isn't it? So how much is the performance benefit you're going to get by doing code specialization for recovery? So his question is, uh, since logging is only done during recovery, how much benefit would you actually get for code specialization? Logging is not always done in recovery. No, no, uh, no, I said the uh, parsing of the logs during the recovery or uh, using code specialization during the recovery phase. So you see, so you're saying it, how, how expensive is parsing the log records? Uh, so you uh, so uh, you said like uh, you could use code specialization for parsing the log records during uh, during the recovery phase. Yes. So, but so my question is because the recovery phase is uh, because the recovery is done only once while the database is starting up. No, no, no. So, so if you do replication, right? Most data systems, the way they implement replications, you send over the right head log, the op log, and then the uh, server side, the replica, is just replaying the log as if it was in recovery mode, right? So you, you would want to do it at runtime as well. You're right. There's other bottlenecks in. Uh, in replication or logging, like reading from disk is always going to be super slow, or growing from the network will be super slow. That, you know, this may not be a huge benefit, but I think this is something that's worth exploring, right? Especially as like non volatile memory and other faster disk and networks come out. Right? This may end up being a problem, right? It's sort of the same argument we're making for the students in general, right? right? When everything was on disk, who cared? But now everything's in memory, this makes a difference, right? It's a good point, though. Okay. All right, so what are the benefits of this, right? So, because we know all our attribute types ahead of time, uh, we can convert what would normally be giant switch statements that says, if an int do this, if a varchar do that, we can bake in to be direct access on, uh, on data and memory and, ex and, and operator on directly. Right? This is one of the advantages of having a, you know, uh, a relational database management system with a relational database in general with, with the schema. Right? If you're going the NoSQL route and you don't have a schema, you, it's hard to do this because the query is not going to know what, that, what, what it's reading, right? Because from one, one record to the next, it could be different. But because we're going to enforce all of this when we insert the data or update it, we know exactly what the type is going to be. We know the length of the, of the data. Um, and we can just convert things to, to, to in the most efficient way to act, actually execute them or operate on them. Likewise, we're going to know all our predicates ahead of time. Uh, so, and because we know the types, in many cases, we'll be able to convert the, our evaluations of the, of the expressions in our, for our predicates down to primitive instruction operations, primitive data type operations. So instead of saying, is, is this attribute equal to this, this value, instead of having a tree and traverse it, I can just load the, that, the two values into CP registers and evoke a single quality instruction, compare instruction, to see whether they match. Right, that's super, super fast. Whereas traversing the, the, the tree is, is really slow and expensive, comparatively. The other big thing that's, this will come up uh, when we talk about hyper is that we're gonna, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna minimize or have no function calls in our loops, right? And this is important because we, we wanna reduce as, as, as many branches as possible. We, I, you wanna get rid of ifs calls, get rid of jumps. And so if we can inline as much as possible, you can't inline everything, but you can inline a lot. In mind, as much as possible, we allow a compiler to uh, maximize its cache reuse, maximize its, 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 its use of CPU registers. All right, so just sort of to ground everyone at a high level where we're at, what we're talking about. So this query compilation and code generating stuff, this occurs after the 
Query Optimizer spits out the physical plan. So again, the client sends a SQL query. We throw that through the parser. That gives us an abstract syntax tree. Then we have a binder uh, where we look up in the catalog and then we do the mapping to say, you know, what table maps to what internal pointer to that table. You guys are doing this in the first project, right? When you bind things or register things in the catalog uh, for your functions, that allows the binder to say, oh, I'm invoking, string, I'm invoking a function called upper. What's the operator ID for that, right? So that's the same thing going on here. So now we have an annotated abstract syntax tree with, with operator IDs or, or internal IDs to say, here's the, here's the actual data structure of the element, the thing you're trying to operate on. We feed that through our query optimizer, that spits out a physical plan, and then we have our code generator or a query, a query compiler generate the actual machine code, the native code that we can use to execute that query, right? So this is done after we have the physical plan. For today's lecture, I'm not going to care about what the physical plan actually looks like, meaning, meaning I don't care whether it's a hash join or a sort merge join. The, the total flow is, is still always going to be the same. In the back. Is, is the native code for start procedures that are attached, or does it do a couple of so your question is, is, if you're compiling store procedures, where does that fit into this? Well, does it, does it perform the, the compilation step every time the store procedures follow? Uh, okay, so his question is, if, I, uh, if I'm doing uh, code generation and query compilation for store procedures, is that done every single, single time you invoke it? Right. No, you, you typically, well, you, you would do this, at least this is what they're doing. You compile it once, throw it in a cache, right. and every single time you invoke it, you just execute it right away. Can you also attach the output of Physical plan too, or? His question is, can I, can I cache the, the output of physical plan compilations? Yes. Is, is, that, is, that, what? is that done in, like... So yeah, uh, most of us try to do that, because we'll see about compilation time in a second. Compilation time could be, could be a lot. Yep. So you try to do that as much as possible. Yep. You can do this, you can actually do this basically the same thing uh, without code generation. You would do this for prepared statements. Right. For prepared statements, you, you, would, you would cache this. Now the tricky thing is that, uh, and which is sort of an unsolved problem in query optimization, is since you don't know what actual the, the parameters you're going to use at runtime when you when you uh, plan the query and cache it, one input may may end up having you know different inputs may have different performance characteristics because it may change the the, the, the distribution of how you access the data, right? For our purposes, we're not gonna, we're going to ignore that for now, right? Yeah, but you try to cache as much as possible. Yeah. And I think in our own system, uh, I think we did this. We just added this okay. last month, right? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So the two ways we do code generation are, are the following. The first one is called translation, right? And again, this is basically we're going to have we're going to write code that generates code that we compile, all right? And so then you, you compile it using an off-the-shelf compiler like GCC, Clang, or, or ICC. And then the other approach is to do JIT compilation. It's where we're going to have code that can generate an inter intermediate representation of the query. This is called IR. And then we can compile that quickly uh, into machine code that we can then invoke. Right? This, this is, we use the LLVM to make this happen. So I'm going to go through each of these. I'll, I'll start with the first one. So, this is from a paper a few years ago from these guys in Edinburgh for a system they, they, they had uh, called Haiku. And this is a, this is a classic example of a translation uh, database system. So for a given query plan, their database system would then generate C code on the fly that essentially implemented exactly the execution of that query. Right? So again, you, 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 all the predicates, all the expressions, you know how to put that into uh, direct form that you can execute without having to do look, additional lookups or, or walk the tree like I showed before. And then they just do fork exec on GCC, give it that C code that is generated, GCC spits out a shared object, you link that in into your process, so now it's in your address space, and then you invoke a function to invoke, to invoke it. All right, so when you open up the terminal and you type a select query and hit go, it, it, it does all these things. All right? So let's walk through an example of this. Right, so they have a simple query, select star from A, where a.val equals input parameter plus one. So the interpreted plan would essentially look something like this. Right? I'm going to iterate over all my tuples, go grab a tuple at a given offset, then evaluate my predicate to see whether it, it, it evaluates to true, and if so, then I admit it. 
And this is also following the iterator model, the tuple at a time model that we talked about in the beginning. So this seems pretty simple, right? But there's actually a lot more that going on that I'm not showing here, right? So in case of actually getting the tuple, you have to go get the catalog of the table. I mean, you would typically cache this after you go to the first time. You still have to go do that. Then you're going to calculate the offset of what tuple you're trying to access based on the tuple size. <coughs> so remember, we have a fixed length data pool for, for all the fixed length data of the tuples. So I know how to take, well, if my tuple is one kilobyte and I want the, the 20th tuple, I know how to multiply those two together to jump to the correct offset for the thing that I want. And then we're going to return a pointer to this. The next thing, if I'm going to do that evaluation, well, now I got to do, I got to traverse that tree that I showed at the beginning to evaluate uh, the two sides of the, you know, the, of the tree structure to get all the data that I need and then see whether it evaluates it true. And if it does, then I know I want to uh, go down this branch and then emit it, right? So now what the Haiku source-to-source uh, -source compiler will actually generate instead is something that looks like, sort of like this. So the first thing we're going to see is that at the very top, we're going to have uh, now placeholder variables for uh, all the things that, that, that we're going to need. All right, so we can bake in ahead of time exactly what the size of the tuple is. We know how to jump to the right offset for our input parameters to find the predicate we want. We know what type it is. Uh, and then we know how to, uh, we know, or sorry, this is, this is to get the offset into the tuple for the, the value that we want. And this is the offset for the, or the actual value for the parameter we want to evaluate against. All right, so now what we do at runtime, we fill in these parameters as we execute this query, or just like as, you, as if you're building a function, and this is gonna be way more efficient, right? So in this case, this case here, this was the example that I was saying before. Instead of having traverse an expression tree with an equal sign and then a parameter and then the tuple value, I can just bake this into a single instruction, does something equal something. And I know how to fill in these parameters because I've, I've, I have them already, already computed, right? And this is way, way faster than having to do inter interpret what the query plan is, figure out what, what the type they want uh, for every single tuple as you iterate over them. Okay? So the way you could build this in a database system is actually kind of nice, right? Because your, your, your code generator is going to make query code that actually can interact with any other part of your database management system. So that means that in our generated code, if we want to invoke a function or we, in, in, in the index, or we have a concurrential transaction manager that we want to invoke to keep track of things, we can easily generate code that can then in, in, invoke them directly. Right? And there's also a nice advantage of this that makes it easy to debug because you have C code, you crash, you open up GDB and figure out you know, what, 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 why you fail. You can add debug symbols to keep track of things like, you know, this line was generated by this, this line in the generated code was produced by this line in your, in your uh, code generation code, right? So th 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 this is kind of nice. So now they have this great experiment that I like to show from this paper um, where they're going to evaluate their source to source compiler, their code generator versus a bunch of other different ways to actually uh, implement your, your database system for doing uh, query evaluation. So at the very top, they have what they call generic iterators. And this is where you're just doing two at a time processing with a generic uh, uh, interpretation engine that knows how to operate any possible query with any possible type, right? This is essentially what we have in our own system, the interpreted engine. This is like, this is how most people implement their database system. Right? This is what uh, Postgres does, MySQL does, right? This is the, the, the standard way of impl implementing uh, a data system. And then they're also going to have uh, it's an optimized version of these where now instead of having a generic uh, iterator, they're going to have specific ones for integers, floats, and bar chars that are specialized to actually execute on particular data types. And then they're going to have a generic version that, that was written by hand by presumably a grad student. Um, and then they're going to have an optimized version that's sort of like the optimized iterator where they're going to have, uh, they're going to write iterators that are specific to the different types. But again, the way you think about the, the, the hard-coded ones is it's a hard-coded C plan that only knows how to execute that single query, right? It's not, it's, 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 it's not you know, general purpose. And if you have another query, you have to rewrite the program and do, have it do something else. And at the bottom, they're going to have their high -Q, uh, the code generator engine. So uh, for this, it's a, 
the paper's a bit old, so the machine is, is, is a bit dated, but I still think the, uh, the results are relevant for our discussion here. Um, so what they're going to do is they're going to do a breakdown of the execution time for the queries, and they're going to measure between how much time is spent doing L2 cache misses, memory stalls, and actually executing instructions. Um, in the paper, they also show L1 cache misses, but that time is like so small that I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to bother uh, showing it. Right? It doesn't affect our discussion, but they're in the original paper. So the, the first thing to point out is that you only see in the uh, iterator models and then the generic hard-coded version that you have memory stalls, right? Just again, what's going on here is that for doing predicate evaluation and other things, there's these giant switch statements that you have to use to say, well, is my predicate this, or is, is it on this type, and do that evaluation. And all that ends up being extra code. You have jumps now into different parts in, in the address space of your process. You're grabbing more data than you maybe actually need. So that's causing you to have uh, memory stalls. Over here, we see that in the optimized hard-coded and the haiku, haiku uh, execution code, um, they almost have very little memory stalls. So you're basically operating almost directly out of uh, your CPU caches, which is really nice, which is sort of what you want. The haiku uh, performance is slightly better than the optimized hard-coded one, and this is because the source code generator can generate code that is actually better for the the CPU are better for the compiler to optimize than what we as humans would normally write. So it's generating code that if you had to read it as a human, it would take you a long time to understand what was going on, but it turns out that's the best way to actually execute it on, on a modern CPU. And that's why they're doing slightly better. So what's one obvious problem with source-to-source source source compilation or transpilation? Let's see, in, in the approach that they're using here. Compilation time. Compilation time, exactly, right? So, and for every single query, right, with Haiku, they're going to do a fork exec on GCC, feed in their C, their C code, let it compile it, spit out the shared object, and then link it in, right? So you think about what's going on, like when you start GCC, right, you have to parse all the command line parameters, you got to parse configuration files, set up memory, right? And they're doing this every single time. It's really expensive. So in, in this graph here, what they're showing is the compilation time for three queries in TPCH. Uh, where one time they're using O0, o zero, meaning like no, comp, no optimizations, and then they're doing uh, compilation with O2. I don't know why they'd include O3. Uh, as far as I know, most production software is shipped with O3 turned on, right? If you, if you don't need to have debug symbols. Um, and so what you see is that the, with O2, uh, it's almost two to three times slower than uh, what you would get with O0. But even then, O0 is, is pretty long, right? It takes a long time to run. So that, you know, for Q1, you know, if your query takes, you know, 20 milliseconds to run, but it takes you 100 milliseconds to compile it, what's the point, right? So, um, so this, this is the big problem that, that they have to deal with. So the, the big observation, though, we got from, you get from Haiku is that the way that the organize the code that they would generate for the query plans is actually turned out to be more efficient if they target the CPU that they were trying to run on, right? So rather than having us as humans write the code in, in a way that we can understand and engineer and change over time, they said, well, we know no one's ever should ever have to debug our uh, generated code once we, once we know it's working. So we can do it in a way that's most efficient for, for, for the hardware we're trying to target. Then we also see that the, uh, the compilation time is, is, is really long. This is actually the approach that, that MemSQL first used when their first version of the system came out. Um, and then they made heavy use of caching to avoid this like one second startup time for every single query. Um, we'll we'll talk, about that, talk about that at the end of the lecture. The other thing about Haiku is also is that uh, because they're still using the tuple at a time approach, it's not gonna allow for, for full pipeline. Right? So this is what the hyper paper talks about when, that you guys read. Right? So a pipeline is basically a question. Uh, wouldn't caching help only if you execute the same query again because you need to generate machine code for every new query? Yes, so his statement is, wouldn't, would caching only help if you know you're executing the same query over and over again? Absolutely. So in an OLTP application, the, the queries are usually invoked from, from, from the application code, like some PHP code, Java code, you invoke a function, Right? So it's always going to go through the same code path. 
is always going to invoke the same queries. In that case, you can cache those. If, uh, if you open up your terminal and type a random query in, it's never going to, you never saw it before, it may never see it again, so caching doesn't help you. So absolutely, yes. For, 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 for OLTP, 200 millisecond compilation time is really bad. For OLAP, depending on the query, it may or may not be bad. Yes? The following his question, are like the queries with different parameters are considered like as the same queries? So his question is, are queries with input parameters, are they considered to be the same query? Yes. Right? It's a prepared statement. You know that it's going to be the same thing over and over again. Uh, in the case of MemSQL, we'll see this at the end, they actually, if you didn't have input parameters, you didn't have the question marks, they would actually go and extract them automatically and convert your query into a parameterized query and it, so, so that they could reuse it. And it even holds true for like Kojin part. Correct, for the Kojin stuff, yes. Yes. Question over here. Okay. All right, so pipelines. So a pipeline is basically a, uh, a segment in our query plan where we can process the same, same tuple from one operator to the next. Right? The idea is that if you want to maximize cache locality, rather than having all these function calls or these conditional branches, or, you know, or, or, or do the operator, the operator time model where we process all the tuples from one operator and then move up to the next one and process all the same ones, the idea is that for a single tuple, we want to go as far up as in the tree as we can because we're going to maximize our cache locality and reduce the number of cache principles. Right? So in this query here, it's going to have four pipelines. And so the easiest way to think about that is, I think, is pipeline number two here. So we're going to do a scan on B and then apply our filter, and then we're going to feed this into our aggregation. So as we're scanning B for every tuple, we can apply the predicate, and then we have to stop at the aggregation, right, because we can't compute the count of the number of tuples we have until we know what number, number of tuples we have, right? So we can process a single tuple up to here, then we put it into our hash table for our aggregation, and then we have to stop. Right? That's the pipeline breaker or the pipeline boundary. And then go back and get the next tuple. Right? Same thing over here. For every tuple in A, I apply my predicate, but then now I want to do a join, say I'm doing a hash join. So I'm on the build side of the join here, so I, I would put it into my hash table, but then I have to stop processing that tuple, I gotta go back and get the next one. So the idea here again, we just wanna have as long pipelines as possible and take the same, the same tuple and go up as far, far as we can into the tree as much as possible so that it's in our CPU registers and we can process it very quickly. And you couldn't do this very easily in the, um, uh, you could do this sort of in the tuple at the time approach, but because of all those function pointers, those are conditionals and that, that's why it's problematic. So the hyper guys, this paper, was crazy about this paper. I realized there's a bunch of LLM IR, which is it's a bit dense to read, but the reason why I had you guys read this paper is because it's sort of the first one uh, that sort of laid out how to do LLM compilation for a database system. And the crazy thing about it too is that it's written by like one dude, right? Thomas Neumann is, is a freak. And I say that in a good way. Um, he supposedly wrote 8% of hyper by himself, right? And he wrote this paper by himself. It, that's, it's, it's amazing. And he's got three kids, too. Like, I have zero kids. <laughs> and I don't have time to write papers like that. And plus write all the code, right? So he's awesome. Uh, and again, we're going we're to come across Hyper a lot throughout the semester. So what, there, what this paper shows is that you can compile queries into, uh, in, in memory into native code using the LLVM uh, compiler toolkit. They also propose that uh, if you want to maximize cache locality, that you actually want to use a push-based model where you can ride a tuple as far as you can up into the query plan as much as possible to, and avoid doing branches and function lookups. And this is essentially saying that instead of having an operator-centric view of how we want to execute a query and process data, which is how we would normally think about things as, as humans, like we look at the tree and say, all right, this is one operator, this is the next, right? Instead, we want to have a data-centric approach where we think about how to move data around rather than how do we you know, maintain boundaries between uh, between the different operators. So a quick show of hands, who here has, has, who here has heard of LLVM? Okay, eh, 70%, okay, cool. So the LLVM is a collection of compiler uh, tools um, that originally came out of UIUC. So my understanding was they were trying to build a replacement for the Clang compiler, 
and they end up building this this whole this whole um, this whole uh, framework or this collection of, of of things you can do you know build other more complicated things on top of. And so the core component of of the LLVM is their low-level programming language or intermediate representation or IR that is sort of similar to assembly. Right? So you can sort of think of this as like JVM or the, or the Java bytecode, right? But it's not tied to Java. So you can generate IR, right, in your in whatever language you want to use. Right? You could you could have like in Scala and the Scala spits out IR, then you compile that in the LLVM. In our case, we're using C++. The idea is that we can generate this IR that can then be compiled by the LLVM compiler, and it can target any, any ISA or any, any architecture that you want. So the same IR that we generate for Peloton, we could have it then run on ARM or Power or x86. All right, so that's, that's, that's pretty powerful. So the key thing to point out, though, and I think uh, he mentions this in the paper, is that we don't need to write an, our entire database management system completely in LLM IR. Right? He has that appendix where he shows all the instructions, right? First of all, I can understand it. Uh, and it'd be hard to find people that, you know, in general, who, who could understand this kind of stuff. And that's why we have those C++ macros to, for, for an Iron system to abstract away the low-level details of how to actually generate the IR for you. Um, but the key thing about it is that the LM code can actually make invocations into C++. So we get the same advantages that we had with Haiku, where even though we have our code specialized, or specialized code for our query, we don't have to put the entire uh, functionality of the database system in that generated code. Right? We can have the generated code invoke our regular C++ code that, that doesn't need to be uh, compiled uh, in, in, at runtime. Right? So our indexes are all written in C++ because it would be really hard to actually build and debug a fast index in LLMIR. And so we have, we have the proxy stuff that, that allows us to make these calls into C++. Right, you have to do some mangling of the class names to find the right location in memory. But again, Prashant has taken, all, taken care of all of that for you. All right, so now with the push phase model, uh, it, it, we're going to take the pipelines we had over here, and then we can generate, essentially, uh, pseudocode that sort of looks like this. Right? So for the first pipeline, where we do a scale on A, then we have our predicate, and then if it matches, then we're going to put it into our hash table that we know we're going to need for the later pipeline to, 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 to do the join. And so again, this is just pseudocode, uh, but the, 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 w the way that sort of can, the important thing to get out of this is like things like doing predicate evaluation, right, does something equal something that no longer needs to be the expression tree. We just load these two things into our register and then do execute a single instruction to do a comparison. Right? And then we can do, execute pipeline two, pipeline three, and then once we have everything, then we can finally execute pipeline four. So now we're not going to talk about parallel execution in this class. This will come up later. But it's sort of obvious to see that we could execute one and two in parallel with each other because they don't depend on other pipelines being executed. Furthermore, there's nothing to say that we couldn't have multiple threads execute a single pipeline at the same time. Right? So I could have 10 threads all execute pipeline one. They all operate on different segments of the table, and they produce their, output, their own output, and then we can combine them together later on. All right, we'll cover this uh, how to do parallel execution later, but for simplicity reasons, we just assume that everything's single threaded for now. Yes? Uh, the generated query plan looks very similar to a materialized model where you look at the leaf nodes and look at all the tuples in the leaf node and then push them up. So the statement is that this pseudocode here looks a lot like the. Um, Materialized. Ma the materialized, yeah, or, yeah, the operator time model right. where you push all the data up. Yes, but like in this case here, uh, I'm going to do my scan on B, uh, and then I, and then for every single tuple, I'm, I'm operating one tuple at a time. It's in this case here, the scan everything. Ah, so in this case here, I could start emitting tuples out from this join to this join without waiting for the join to finish. I have to wait for all C to go in. Actually, that's not even true either. I take a single tuple and I scan out a C, do my probe, my join, once I know that this thing's been populated, I check to see whether I have a match. If I do match, then I can go up and do the join there. So that's different than the, than the materialization model, right? Again, the idea is here is rather than having, uh, just you know, taking a tuple, checking to see whether there's a match, going back in the next tuple, check to see if there's a match, because right, now you're swapping that thing in and out of your caches. 
I take a single single tuple and write it all the way up. Right. Okay, so for this, uh, for these numbers here are coming from the paper. Um, so they're going to take TPCH and they're going to compare against uh, uh, two versions of Hyper actually. So Hyper actually ended up first started implementing it the Haiku way, where you generate C++ code and then compile it. Uh, and then they went off and implemented it with the LLVM engine. So it's kind of nice within a single system, we actually can do a comparison between the LLVM approach and the C++ approach. And then I can compare this against VectorWise, uh, which we'll talk about later. And then MoneyDB is the, VectorWise came out of the MoneyDB project. Um, VectorWise does compilation a different way. MoneyDB only does compilation on the, on the predicates, but not the actual uh, full query plan. And then I think it's called DBX in the paper, but it's just Oracle. Um, <laughs> like Oracle doesn't do, this version of Oracle doesn't do any compilation at all. So what you see across the board is that with the LLVM uh, and their sort of push-based model, it, it always executes uh, almost as fast, almost as fast as, uh, faster than everyone else. Um, and certainly beats the um, uh, Oracle and, and in some cases, uh, vector-wise does a little bit better. Now, yeah, sometimes vector-wise wins or is pretty close. Vectorwise, again, is doing compilation, but in a different way. Plus, they also can do vectorized operations, which we'll, we'll cover later. All right, so the, uh, in the numbers I just showed you before, they weren't including the, the compilation costs, right? It's purely just execution. So here in this graph, it's not a true apples-apples apples comparison because I'm taking results from the Haiku, Haiku paper and, and comparing them against the... Uh, the hyper paper for their compilation of LVM. So it's not running on the, on the exact same hardware, but at least gives you an idea of what the ballpark difference is for these things, right? So with their LLVM engine, they're compiling queries in roughly, you know, less than 40, 40 milliseconds, at least for, for these queries here, right? This is just showing that you can compile queries with the LLVM engine because everything's always in memory, uh, much faster than you would have if you have to fork the process and, run, and you know, spit it out, you know, generate uh, GCC code, or just generate code to get into GCC. So these numbers look okay, right? 15 milliseconds is not bad, right? especially for an ODOT query. Um, but the problem is what they found out later on is that the, the, the compilation time for queries ends up growing super linearly. And because it depends on how large a query is. So it depends on things, the number of joins, the number of predicates, the <coughs> number of aggregations, right? So if you have a really large query, the compilation time is, is going to explode. So the, the two examples could be um, a lot of times there are machine-generated queries. Like if you have like a dashboard or a tool for doing analytics, you click a bunch of buttons, you want to explore some data, and then that generates a SQL query that you then invoke. These queries can actually get quite large. Uh, some friends at Google told, Google told me that they often see queries that are like 10 megabytes in size. Right? So it's not operating with 10 megabytes of data. The SQL itself is 10 megabytes. Right? Uh, the other thing that, that, that came up was, and this was a problem with Hyper, is that, like us, they want to support the Postgres wire protocol and the Postgres catalog. So what they did was, when they, when they were getting acquired by Tableau, they would plug in PG Admin, which is like a, a web-based administration tool for, for Postgres. Well, the way PG Admin works is when you turn it on, it fires off a bunch of queries into the catalog to figure out what tables you have, what types you have, and so forth. And so there was one query that came out with like 22 table join. Um, and to compile that took like a second with Hyper using the LLVM. So it'd be the problem where you would turn on PG Admin, point it at Hyper, and then it would stall for a couple seconds before it actually you know, became available. Whereas in Postgres, because it's not doing compilation, it could fire up right away the queries. It may execute slower than the way Hyper does, but it doesn't have to do all that, that expensive compilation ahead of time. So as I sort of said before, it's not that really big of an issue for OLTP queries because you're going to be executing the same ones over and over again. Uh, you can parameterize them and then cache, cache the query plan. But this is a major problem with OLAP workloads. <coughs> so the way they solved it, which I think is actually really clever, um, I'm actually excited that, that actually I can tell you guys about it because I knew about this last year because uh, uh, one of the Hyper guys came and visited us at CMU for a month, uh, Victor Lees. And we were talking about this problem, and they were like, yeah, we solved it a year ago. Uh, this, so this is last year. We solved it a year ago, but we haven't read the paper yet. We just haven't gotten around to doing it. So I felt bad because I, I would teach the class, and I'm like, all right, here's this really sucky problem. 
but there's a way to solve it, but I can't tell you what it is, at least not on video, because I didn't want anybody to have problems. I didn't, I didn't want them to have problems when they try to publish the paper and get scooped. But now the paper came out in ICD 2018. It hasn't been announced yet, but Victor sent it to me. It has been accepted. So I can tell you what they're doing now, which I think is really clever. And this is actually something we want to pursue. So what they're going to do now is you're going to take your query. You're going to generate the LLM IR, right, just as you normally would. But uh, you're going to go and compile it, which is going to be slow, right? But while you're waiting for it to com compile, you start interpreting that IR. Right? Sort of like a thing of like a virtual machine or like the JVM. Right? You're going to start interpreting it and start processing the data. And then at some point, the compilation is going to be done. And then you just can seamlessly slide in the <laughs> compiled code to replace the interpreted code and execute it. And just you know, pick and get, get the faster version of it. So the way to sort of think about this is rather than having like what we have now in our system, we have the old interpreted engine, we have the LLM engine. They don't talk to each other. They don't have the same semantics. They don't often produce the same output. Instead of having two separate code bases like that, you can have something that can take the same query execution plan, the same, uh, you know, the, the, the IR that you generate, then interpret that. It'll go slow, but it's going to be exactly the same as the compiled version. And then when the compiled version is done, you just slip in the, the faster version. Or if, if the query was super short, then the interpreted version will, will finish right away. Then you cache the compiled plan, and you, you can reuse it the next time you execute. So it sort of looks like this. So they call this adaptive execution. So we have a SQL query comes in, and, and then you're going to run it through their query optimizer. And it's a, for, for, for Hyper, it takes them uh, uh, two tenths of a millisecond. And then you're going to feed this into your code generator, and that takes uh, seven tenths of a, of a millisecond. And now at this point, you have L of N IR. So now you're going to split off uh, into three different paths. The first is going to have a, sort of a simple bytecode compiler this is basically the interpreter that you know is just going to take the bytecode and, 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 and you know, almost be like a virtual machine and execute it. Then you're going to have the um, then you're going to have another thread that's going to take the IR and run it through an unoptimized compiler, right? And this only takes six milliseconds to run, um, but you can you know this is it's not going to be like O3. It's not going to do all the extra you know uh, optimizations you would normally get in a, in a regular compiler. And then another threat is going to do multiple passes with the LLVM optimization optimizer, then take the optimized IR, run that through the compiler again, and then generate machine code. So the idea here is that if your query can finish uh, before seven, this 17 milliseconds plus 25 milliseconds is done, if you can finish interpreting the query before you get to this part, then you're done and you have the answer. Otherwise, you slip in the, the x86 that you just generated and have that be run now pick up where you left off, where the, where the interpreter left off, and run that really, really fast. Right? So I think this, this, is, this is a clever way to do this. Um, and this solves the problem. Like, OK, uh, if I have a really simple query and the compilation is going to take a long time, then I just have the interpreted version and I, and I spit the output and I'm done. But for longer running things, uh, uh, the optimizer, I can still make forward progress while my compiler is running. Yes? So one of the benefits you talked about is uh, keeping the data in the register. So yes. If you have all the stuff running in the background, isn't that sort of going to like mess up like your cache or your registers along the way? So his question is, I made a big point that we want to minimize the, uh, we want to maximize the reuse of data in our CPU registers. But if now I have other threads compiling in the background, is that going to mess that up? So typically what you do in a multi-thread system is that you will pin execution threads to cores. And then all of the background tasks, they run on other cores. So there'll be no interference. That's the, that's the way you get around that. Yes? What's the overhead of actually switching out uh, an implementation? Because it sounds like that. I don't know what kind of guarantee you get with this sort of approach, but it doesn't seem trivial that you can map one uh, progress to the other. Because they might have the same. Right. So his question is, uh, his question is, how can I slip in the the ex, the compile code and know that I'm picking up where I left off on the on the interpreted code, right? When having having false positive or false negatives, right? So think of it as the the the, the unit of execution for the engine is is a block of data. Hyper calls this morsels. We'll read this paper later on. But the idea is that the, the interpreted engine says, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this table. It has 10 blocks. 
So I'll grab the first block. I'll run my interpreted engine on that. I finish that block. Now go check to see what the compile version is done. It's not. Let me get the next block. Interpret that, right? And so at some point, the compile version will be done. You set a flag. The, the interpreter version says, oh, I'm, I'm done processing my block. I shouldn't grab the next one because the compile version is done. So I, I stop. But that's how you avoid that problem. In the back, yes. Um, why is this only a problem for the LLVM compilation, or like the super linear thing, or is, all, is it also a problem for the C++ compilation? So this question is, is the, the growth of the uh, executable, or growth of compilation time, is that only specific to the LLVM, or is that also a problem in GCC? It is a problem in both. Yes. So here it comes from interpreting the bytecode, then uh, execute. So when the unoptimized code is ready, it starts executing the unoptimized code, and then when yes. the optimized code is ready. Yes. So again, the paper's not, it's not officially out yet, but it's on the website. We, Victor sent to us and made available. It's a, it's, it's, it's a good read. Yes? Uh, when you're doing this, are we not actually restricting the compiler, the order in which it is actually executing? Because now the interpreter and the compiler kind of have to do things in the exact same order. The question is, am I, am I requiring that the, the, the compiler or the compiled version? The compiled version. Am I requiring that the compiled version do things in the exact same order as, as this one? So the order of what? Instructions or the order of operators? I would say operators. Right, so operators, that's, that's determined here. The IR generates the, 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 the actual execution instructions to execute the query. So that's going to be, at a high level, that's going to be the same. Now, when I take multiple passes on this, it may end up reordering the instructions, but the, the order of the operators will be the same. And if I'm saying, so think about it. Uh, is that necessary? Because, you know, when you have the LLVM IR, and that's then the optimization passes that you're running on that, I can reorder everything, you know, significantly. Okay. It's going to reorder the instructions, but it's still going to produce the same output. Yes, I do agree that the output will be the same, but the order in which even the tools are processed, can they not be different? Or so the question is, are the tools going to be operating in, in different order? Again, even then, I mean, I have to check to see whether like it's sorting, but like even then, it, relational algebra is unsorted, so it doesn't matter. I, I so like if you know, I if I have my IRs like here's operator one, operator two, it's a big chunk of code. It's not going to magically put the other operator above that and somehow violate some some ordering guarantee. It'll swap around instructions and things like that. And reorder those, but it's not going to make it's not going to make logical changes to the the, the, the query plan. Yes. What exactly is the bytecode compiler doing? It's taking LLVM IR and and then it's generating like a almost like another intermediate language. It's just like really dumb. Really, d really simple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let me keep going because I want I want to go through other examples of these. All right. So here's a bunch of different systems that are doing them. I mean, as you see, that like. It's not everyone, it's not a lot of them. Right? This is this code generation stuff has really gotten in vogue in, in recent years. Um, so I'm gonna go through a high level a, a, a bunch of these and, and see what they do. So, as in all things in databases, what seems like super new and super novel and super cool, IBM did in the 1970s, right? This is gonna come across, you're gonna hit this multiple times throughout the semester. So this, to recall, the system our project was was the IBM guys trying to take the relational uh, model paper from Ted Cod and actually implement a real system. So they got a bunch of people that all had PhDs, put them in a single room, and every person with a PhD got their own topic on the system, right? So one person worked on query optimization, one person invented SQL, and so one person worked on, uh, on code generation. So they take SQL quick statements, and then they would generate assembly code by sort of uh, having these pre-generated code templates written in assembly and sort of mashing them together to actually generate the query plan itself, right? Um, they end up actually abandoning it um, when they actually uh, later put out DB2. So remember, IBM never actually released System R. It never actually was commercially available. But the, <coughs> there's different versions of DB2, which we, we can talk about later, but the, one of the main versions end up taking 50% of the code from uh, System R, and they use that as the basis to start DB2. We know this because uh, there's some really great papers, uh, like this one here, The History and Evaluation of System R, where it's like a retrospective of the project, 
And then there is there was a reunion in the, in the 1990s where they, they interviewed a bunch of people that worked on the System R project. And they talked about different things that they did. And one of the things that comes up is this thing turned out to be made a big difference, but it was super hard and super pain to maintain because one, back then it wasn't like x86 was the dominant CPU ISA, right? You know, there's a ton of different chips. IBM had a, a bunch of different chips that all had different assembly. So you'd have to support all of them, and that was a big pain. And the other big issue was any single time somebody changed another part of the system, right? If I take my my, my row header and I add more data to it, now I got to go back and change all of my uh, code generation code to account for that, right? Which, which was uh, a, back then was it was a big pain to actually do this. So when IBM put out DB2, they ended up abandoning this, and then no one really considered this for for thirty years afterwards, right? In Oracle, Oracle, as far as I can tell from reading the, their documentation, and uh, I do this every year to try to figure out whether th things have changed, but as far as I can tell, the only thing, thing that they actually compile are taking PL SQL from the store procedures, they convert it into their, their dialect of C called Pro C, and then they can compile that into native code. So that when you invoke a store procedure as a transaction, you actually get native code. Right? But all the predicate evaluation, all of the, the query, comp, uh, the executed the query, all of that is done through an interpreted engine. Now, one cool thing that Oracle does is that they just jump past uh, uh, code, code generation, query compilation. Instead of having the software you know, generate some native code, they just put the, the stuff on the, on the CPU itself. Right? Uh, Sun bought, uh, or, uh, Oracle bought Sun, and Sun was making these like, Spark chips. So I know in the M7 and then more recently the M8, they end up actually putting Oracle database-specific instructions or operations directly on the Spark chips and then have the data system can invoke them directly. So you don't even need to do code generation, right, or do any specialized code. If everything's on hardware, that's going to be super, super fast. Um, they have some additional stuff to do with vectoriz vectorization, uh, compression, and then uh, memory scans or, or evaluating uh, predicates. All right, so I think this is kind of cool, and Oracle's sort of in a unique position where uh, they can actually do this. The one system that I know from Oracle that can do code generation is like the, the really expensive one called Exadata. So they, they do a predicate push down where they, it's, a, it's a shared disk system. So you have this expensive storage appliance, they can push the predicate there, and then, and then I think that gets compiled. But if you download Oracle, like the, you know, the, uh, the one in the front of your laptop or a local machine, it doesn't, it doesn't actually do any compilation as far as I can tell. We talked about Hecaton before. Uh, Hecaton can do compilation for both uh, the procedures and the SQL. Um, and what's really kind of cool about this is that you can have non-Hecaton queries. Uh, so like within SQL Server, you can have different database engines. So you could have the old engine actually invoke uh, or get request data into the Hecaton engine. Um, and they have these pre-compiled inter operators that allow you to do that very efficiently, which I think is kind of cool. So what they're going to do is they're going to generate C code from the interpreted syntax tree of your store procedure and query, compile that into a DLL, and then link that at runtime. So there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do when you, actually, when you, when you want to do code compilation and link things in like this to make sure that, one, you don't take down the entire system if your code crashes, but also to make sure that you don't, uh, you don't start reading into memory or reading locations uh, in, in, your, in your address space that you shouldn't be and then injecting malicious code or, or having problems. Right, so that, I think that's kind of novel. Cloudera is, or Cloudera Impala is a sort of a, a distributed database or analytical database system designed for run in Hadoop environments. And so they don't do entire code generation or query compilation. They only do LLM compilation for just the, the predicates, the expressions. Um, and then they also actually do it also too for doing record parsing. So because they're trying to run in a Hadoop environment, that means they're reading files from HDFS that may be generated from various different services. So they want to do compilation to read things like Parquet files, CSV files, or ORC files, right? and they can do that really efficiently um, when they bring things to memory. So that's, that's another example of using, uh, you know you're going to just be parsing strings over and over again. You can compile uh, accelerators to make that go faster. Actium Vector is an awesome database system. It's formally called VectorWise. Um, and so what they do, they do actually something very different from everyone else. So instead of having uh, on-the-fly code generation and compilation, they actually pre-compute a bunch of primitives 
to do all possible operations you could, could on your database system ahead of time. And then at runtime, when you evoke a query, they're just stitching together these pre-compiled uh, plans that are optimized for, for your query, or optimized for, for accessing the data a certain way. And then that basically gives you almost the same thing as doing uh, on-the-fly code generation, right? So it sort of looks like something like this. So say that you want to do a scan on a, a table, and you want to do where something is where some attribute is less than some other value. So they'll have a scan less than integer value uh, function and a scan less than double function. Right? It's basically the same thing. It's just they know the size of the uh, the data you're trying to access. And they know how to jump uh, jump to the right offset in order to do that, All right? So in this case here, this bottom one here is to do on a double. The top one is to do on uh, integer. So they generate everything that you could possibly do, and then they just put these things together. So we've done some benchmarking with Vectorwise, and it's actually really really good. It beats a lot of things. Um, we re just just recently we were able to beat it uh, with our LLM engine um, for some things. Uh, the Vectorwise came out of an uh, yeah, uh, academic group in, in Europe. Uh, Actium bought them, and then they basically like killed it. I don't know what they did. They, they, they removed it from their web page. They made it difficult to download, uh, which is a, a real shame. And then basically the whole team left and went to go work on Spark or something like that. So um, it's a shame. This, this, this is a really good system. All right, so we, this, we taught at MemSQL before, uh, and I said that when they first came out, uh, uh, the, the, one of the developers of, or, the, or the founders of MemSQL was at Microsoft and saw the Hecaton project getting developed, although he didn't work on it. So he saw a lot of the early ideas from Hecaton, and then he basically went off and, and sort, of, sort of did the same thing. So they, they do the code generation the way the Haiku does it, where they have their own code, generate C++ code, and they fork a ZEC GCC, link in the shared object, and execute that. And so the question that I think he came up, brought up earlier was, isn't this gonna be really slow if you do it every single time you see a query? And is there a way to actually speed things up if you can cache the query plan? So that's essentially what they, what they would do. So if you have a query like this, where a.id equals 123, they would convert this into a parameterized query or a.id a .id equals some value, and then they would compile that and cache it. Then when another query came along that basically had, had the exact same uh, syntax, just with a different input value, they would then be able to map that to the parameterized cache query plan and then execute that. So as far as I could tell from talking with those guys, um, all they're really doing here is basic string matching, right? So they would extract out the four, five, six here and then see whether that string matches this other string. So they couldn't do things like if, if, if the where clause were a dot id or you know, a equals something and b equals something, if I come along with with another query that's b equals something and a equals something, right, reverse a and b, they would think that's, that's a different query when uh, semantically we know it's exactly the same, right? And so I wanted to show this, this, this I mean, I, maybe I should look at the archive.org. These have this blog article on the website which explain like, all right, you run the query the first time, it takes one second. Then you run the query the second time, it takes zero seconds, right? Because they were doing this, this caching thing. Um, they, they did a good job hiding that, uh, so I wasn't able to find it. So this is before 2016. And then in 2016, they hired this dude from Facebook who helped build the HipHop VM, right, the PHP VM uh, that, that Facebook uses. And he basically re-architected the entire, the entire system to now use LLVM. And they do something I think that is actually very interesting. So instead of doing what we do is we have C++ code that goes directly to IR, they actually have a bunch of different layers and DSLs that goes from a high-level intermediate language that compiles down to a, uh, to a, a bunch of opcodes, and then you can compile that down further to get LLVM IR. All right, so they have an extra layer in between. And so the, the top layer, they have this thing called the MemSQL programming language. This is basically just like a C++ <laughs> dialect that has MemSQL specific things. So then you compile this and you get the MemSQL, MemSQL bit code, and then you can think of this as like the JVM bytecode, or if you've ever seen SQL Lite, the way they have operands, and the way they execute queries, it's sort of the same thing. And then finally, then they can compile that down to IR and then run that as, as native code, right? And the reason why they do this is for, for engineering reasons. It's really hard to hire somebody to work in this level down here, right? It's a lot easier to hire someone who's a general C++ person, right? Because in this case here, you can have the C++ code get compiled into you know 
on your desktop, and then you can run the GDB and step through it and figure out what's going on. If you crash down here, then you don't land with a nice backtrace, you end up with assembly, and it's hard to get people to want to do that. Right. So part of the reason why uh, they went to this route is because of all the same problems IBM was having with the source-to-source the -source compilation. So I visited them like 2013 before I came to CMU, and they sort of confided to me that like if they had to do it all over again, they probably would not have gone with the, the, the code compilation or code generation approach they were using when they first started the company because it was really, really hard for them to, to work on the system and add new features. Uh, but then later on, they, they got a lot of money and I think they did it the right way. All right, uh, the TCB is another system. Uh, There's actually a, a extension to Postgres and Greenplum. So they use the LLVM and they allow support in inter query parallelism beyond what uh, regular Postgres can do. Um, and so this thing looks a lot like Hyper. They're doing a lot of the same techniques. They're doing push-based uh, uh, push processing model. They don't compile the entire query. They only pi compile the, um, the predicates. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that they do that is kind of interesting. So the link here will take you to a YouTube video that talks about how the TCB can get 100x faster than, uh, than Postgres. And it's not just compilation. They, they're also a column store. Um, they do some other things to speak and stuff. Apache Spark added this new engine called Tungsten in 2015. Uh, and they rely on a uh, extension of Scala that allows them to convert the where clause in your, in your SQL predicate into an expression tree. And then they just compile that into a JVM bytecode because Scala runs in the JVM. And then, then they're able to execute it natively. And they have a really good blog. There's a blog article that describes this. And then they have a paper in Sigma uh, from 2015 that talks about this as well as their, um, their, 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 their new optimizer. So I want to finish up with our system. So as, as you're aware of, we use the LLVM. We, the goal is for us to use the LLVM entirely for all our query execution. So we're doing it sort of the hyper way where we're compiling the entire query plan and not just the predicates. Um, we'll cover this paper later on in the, uh, in the semester, but we have a paper that came out in BODB uh, last year that talked about how we actually execute queries. And so the, there's sort of like, the, there's the vector-wise approach and then there's the, the Peloton approach, or sorry, the, the hyper approach. Hyper doesn't do any vectorization as you execute queries because it's pushing a single tuple up all the way up in the query plan. And vector-wise, they make heavy use of uh, moving vectors around, and that allows you to use SIMD instructions to speed up the, the query execution. There's another example of how you can reduce the number of instructions you execute by using SIMD to process multiple data items at the same time. We'll cover SIMD in more detail later this semester, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail how this works, but the key thing we, made, we used to pull this all together was we ended up using software prefetching. So there's a way to invoke intrinsics or instructions to tell the CPU, I'm about to read this piece of memory, go prefetch it and put it in my cache. And so what we're able to do is that we can hide the memory stalls you would get knowing that when you're doing uh, batching or vectorized execution that the hyper guys are trying to avoid so much by using software prefetching. So the last graph I'll show you guys is this one here. Uh, so this is comparing uh, uh, the old interpreted engine that we have in there now with the new compiled version plus with and without this, this relaxed operator fusion. So to keep the plan out here, we're on the log scale. So just take this first query here, Q1. This shows you how crappy our system was uh, and why we had to go switch over to uh, LLVM execution. So this one query here, same hardware, same database, same everything, uh, would take 88 seconds to execute. But then when we, we compiled the LLVM, now we're down to 900 milliseconds, right? That's a significant drop. That's why this is the future for us, why we want to go with this. And that's why everyone else, that's, if you're building a new database system, they're going to want to do code generation and query compilation because the performance benefit you can get is quite significant. And then the little bit better you get by doing vectorization is shown in the red bar here. So you can get maybe a 10 to 20% improvement over that. But the big drop is going from the interpreted engine to the LLM engine. And this is why we're, we're investing all our time doing this. Okay? Again, I'll cover this more in the end of the semester. All right, so the main takeaway of all of this is that query compilation makes a huge difference in performance. Um, but as you're probably aware of in the first project, it's non trivial to implement, right? And in reading that the hyper paper when he shows all the IR, 
it makes your eyes bleed. It's like, oh God, this is terrible, right? <laughs> but the performance difference is so significant and that's why everyone is trying to do this now, right? In my opinion, the 2016 version of MemSQL is probably the best way to do this from an engineering standpoint. Uh, the Hecaton one is very, is, is very good as well. The Hyper one is very good. Ours is very good. We're getting there. It's not, not as good yet. Um, and again, if you're building a new system from scratch these days, you want to do compilation, right? All right, any questions? All right, so, so this was all mostly talking about OLAP. Analytical queries are reading lots of data, right, and that's where compilation really makes a big difference. So now we're going to switch back over to where we normally would, would follow along in the course. I'm talking about more transaction processing, more front-end things. So on, uh, on Monday next week, we'll start talking about concurrency control, or spend about a week and a half talking about different concurrency control models. And then from them, we talk about doing uh, uh, efficient indexes that need to be concurrent as well. Okay? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick To duplicate, fill a breeze as I skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight Then I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burns for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives